everyone in the virtual world to our webinar focusing on multiple measures, uh, placement, assessment, and reporting. Um, first, I wanna extend a huge thank you to our co-hosts, Elizabeth Barnett from the Community College Research Center at Columbia University and Dan Cullinan from MDRC. So thank you so much. Um, we reached out to them and they were readily available to help in any way they could to help um, Texas institutions to um, think about multiple measures and to implement their multiple measures placement policies. Um, so in honor of everyone's time, let's go ahead and get started. And actually, before we do get started, I also want to introduce my colleagues, Keelan Morgan, who started off our webinar today, who works with me very closely uh, in College Readiness and Success Division, and our colleagues in our um, reporting division, Dr. Melissa Humphreys and Dr. Yuji Kim. So thank you everyone for being on board today. So um, go ahead, Keelan, and let's move forward. Uh, before we get into um, the actual meat and bones of the uh, multiple measures issue, I just wanted to go ahead and give a background context that we find ourselves. As we know, we have all been living and breathing um, all of our, uh, our, our virtual world, if you will, because of um, COVID-19 restrictions. And uh, we have, you know, we've, most of us have moved online and, um, you know, we're continuing to uh, figure out ways where we can address our students optimally in, in a virtual world. Uh, many, of many of the institutions are still trying to figure out exactly what their policies will be in the fall. Um, we hear a lot of institutions are maybe doing some sort of combination of online and in person. So definitely, you know, keep in contact with your institutions to find out exactly what those local policies will be. So when we talk about our entering undergraduate students, so these are high school complete students and our students who are still in high school wishing to qualify for dual credit, the first thing that we, of course, want to do, and this has not changed, is we want to verify our students' TSIA status, or TSI status, I should say. And just to remind everyone, when I reference TSI, I'm actually referencing the statute, which uh, requires all uh, non-exempt undergraduate students to be assessed in the areas of reading, writing, and math for their readiness to engage in college-level academic coursework. And of course, that also applies to dual credit students. So um, in verifying TSI status, you're looking at TSI rule 4.54, which lists all of the various exemptions. And for dual credit students, you're looking at uh, the code rule 4.85 for again, all of the exemptions and ways that students can uh, gain access to college level coursework. If a student has not met any of those indicators, then the next thing we recommend is uh, to find out locally whether uh, remote proctoring is available for the TSI assessment. So um, we have been working very closely with our partners at the College Board to um, allow Examity, which is a remote proctoring service, and also to allow video web chat services such as Zoom, MS, uh, Microsoft Teams, WebEx, and so forth. Um, for local uh, proctoring of your students. And so we know um, as of April 4th, over 106,000, uh, sorry, 104,000 students have been administered tests um, via these uh, remote proctoring services. Next slide, please. So for students where uh, access to the TSIA is not available, uh, Commissioner Keller has approved three options. The first option is to enroll the student in a co-requisite model. Now, we just need to be aware though for dual credit students, so for high school students wishing to qualify for dual credit that have not met one of the uh, eligibility requirements outlined in 4.85 in the code. Um, for those students, um, the just institutions need to be aware that the developmental education portion of the co-requisite model is not eligible for state funding. So. Just uh, as a quick reminder, a co-requisite model uh, is, is a model where the student enrolls directly in the college level course, but is also required to co-enroll in a developmental education support or intervention. 
well, that co-enrollment in the developmental ed support or intervention is not eligible for state funding for high school students. For enter entering undergraduates, yes, it is available as it always has been, it has not changed. The second option is direct placement in the entry level college course and that is allowable in the code in rule 4.55 which has an exceptional circumstance clause and uh, the only other thing to uh, you know be aware with this particular clause is that um, the rule still qualifies and outlines and requires that the student still has to be assessed on the TSIA by the end of the semester in which the student was placed in that college level course. Um, there is a little bit of nuance here that institutions will probably want to be aware of. For example, if just like always, if the student is doing very well in the college level course and uh, it, you know has a very good chance of passing that college level course, then the TSIA is not required. But in all other circumstances, it will be required. Uh, the third option is again direct placement in the entry level course via the code rule 4.54, which is one of the exemptions which classifies the student, whether it be the high school student or the college student as non-degree or non-certificate seeking. And again, uh, an important caveat for this one is for undergraduates, for those who are high school complete and are enrolled at your college or university, they will not be able to use any federal financial aid which includes Pell Grant, student loans and work study, they won't be able to have access to those federal financial aid opportunities if the student is classified as non-degree or non-certificate seeking. So that's another caveat that's gonna be important to consider. Next slide, please. So when you have these three options, we know, you know, we always say this in, in education, one size does not fit all. So we, invite institutions to use other factors so that they can determine uh, is the student best served through a co-requisite model given all the caveats as well or is this student best served in direct placement to the college level course and um, whichever uh, additional factors which will of course will be the meat of this uh, webinar today um, but whichever additional factors that you use you have to be also prepared to report those to the coordinating board because the important thing is through this natural experiment that we all see ourselves involved in in this next academic year so again commissioner keller's um, provisions are valid all the way through next summer so uh this summer fall 2020 spring 2021 and summer 2021 these three options are available to all students um, through uh, next summer 2021 and so in order for us to see how students fared, it's going to be very important for institutions to be able to accurately report which provisions and which factors were used for placement purposes so that we can also um, see how students fare based on those placements and, and um, also use the data for possible um, future policy recommendations or changes in policy for TSI. So again, um, we are gonna be talking, um, our colleagues, Dr. Melissa Humphrey, Humphreys and uh, Dr. UG Kim, at the end of this session today, are gonna be talking more details about the reporting. Next slide. So here I'm gonna go ahead and turn it over um, to Dr. Barnett and Dr. Cullinan, who are gonna talk about multiple measures assessment and placement. Good afternoon. Thank you so much, Suzanne. Really a pleasure to be joining everybody this afternoon and um, sharing some of the research that we've done and some of the thinking over the past six years that we've been working on this topic. Um, next slide. Um, I'm gonna start us off today. I'm with the Community College Research Center, Elizabeth Barnett and my colleague, Dan Cullinan is from MDRC. And our two organizations, um, got together to um, form a center, the Center for the Analysis of Post-Secondary Readiness under a grant from the federal government from IES. And um, it was to dig deeply into this whole question of college readiness. We were funded to do three big studies um, and then a number of, of smaller studies um, were in the process of, of wrapping this, you know, this phase of the work up. But first of all, we did a 
a descriptive study to look around the country and see who is doing what in developmental education and in placement. So we'll share some of the results from that. We're also doing an evaluation of the new Mathways project in Texas that I'm sure you're very familiar with. And then we worked with the State University of New York to do an evaluation of new assessment practices. And that's um, some of the information that we're going to be sharing today. And um, as well as some information from another project we're collaborating on in uh, Minnesota and Wisconsin. So next slide, please. So the agenda, um, first of all, um, so just some information on why use multiple measures for placement. You know, the reason why it's, it's become an, you know, become of interest to people. And secondly, a little information on the national picture, who's doing what. Third, what your options are in the current moment, thinking a little bit about, you know, some of the lack of access to testing, but in general, just thinking through what can go into a multiple measure system. Um, then we'll share some of the information that we learned from our research, some of the um, practices that can affect student outcomes. And um, we have a few brief comments on CORAC dual enrollment. We leave it to the, you know, the presentation you heard earlier. So, and then we'll have a little time for Q&A. So, next slide, please. And once again, so what do we mean by multiple measures assessment? So it's a system that combines two or more measures to place students into appropriate courses and or supports. And we sometimes get the question about whether that means that they have to be considered at the same time. Um, as they might be in an algorithm, you know, where you weight different factors differently according to how well they predict students' um, success in college. And we use the term more broadly. So this, here we're talking about a system where you um, have the possibility of taking into account, you know, different measures that may be used in different ways. And we'll talk more about what those ways are. So next slide. When it comes to um, national trends, this is showing you what's been happening um, between 2011 and 2016. And I think we, you know, from everything we've heard, the trend is continuing in the same direction. Basically, what we see is many more people, both community colleges and public four year colleges, are using measures other than standardized tests for assessment. That, they may be using standardized tests as well, but they're using um, additional measures as part of their assessment system. And you can see that that's slightly more the case in math and in reading. Next slide, please. As far as what measures they're using, practically everybody, and this is as of 2016, practically everybody was using standardized tests as part of their assessment system. We're starting to hear more um, stories of, of people who are, go who are using tests less or not at all, um, but that's you know, not reflected in, in 2016 data. Um, the second most common is the use of high school performance data, mostly the high school GPA, and we'll be talking about that quite a lot because it's um, probably the, across multiple studies, the most um, valuable measure, the, the one that best predicts success in college level courses. Some colleges are also using planned course of study, particularly in math these days, as students um, figure out what math they need for their intended major or career track. And then a few are using other indications of motivation or commitment. And that can be in the form of a more formal assessment, like um, a non-cognitive assessment, or it can be part of, say, a, a directed self-placement system. The next slide. So where did the interest come about in the use of multiple measures? Basically, it came about through research that was done showing that individual placement tests were not doing a particularly good job of um, accurately placing students. So my colleague, Judy Scott Clayton, and this was also um, work from several other scholars, um, Belfield and Crost and others, um, did some analyses and they took um, a big data set and they looked at where students were placed just according to the exam, and they compared it to where students would have been placed if they had been um, placed using many, many different measures, you know, resulting in a much more powerful model than, than the exam alone. 
And what this showed was that many students were being placed correctly. So where the check marks are, you see students placed either way in either developmental or, or college level. But where there was a lot of concern were the students who were underplaced. So we had a, a good number of students, really a substantial number of students who were being placed into developmental courses, even though they could have passed their college level course with a B or better. So it was a pretty high bar. So we have you know, close to a quarter of students that could have been um, placed into college level and been successful and you know, more like a fifth of math students. So people got worried about that because when you start in developmental education, you're less likely to complete for a whole series of reasons that we could talk about. You also had some students who were overplaced, so they probably should have been in developmental, but were in college level, but that was much less frequent and, and therefore more, less of a concern. The next slide, please. So the research that they were doing was compared, um, you know, dug further into what some of the alt alternative measures might be. And so they were comparing what happened if you use tests, if you used high school GPA, and then what happened if you combined the two of them together? And um, also what happened if you integrated some other data points, um, depending on, on the college and um, what measures they might have available at the, at the moment of admission, which is when you're trying to figure out placement. Um, Next slide. And what they saw is um, a pattern that's been um, shown to occur in many, many different colleges. So these are actually colleges from our State University of New York study, and it's showing their, um, their proportion of um, variance that's explained by each of these factors. And we don't need to get into the details, but I think the important thing is that over and over again, you see the GPA alone does, you know, a pretty decent job of predicting success in the college level English or math course. Tests alone do not. They almost always show up as, as just not having um, very much predictive power. If you put them together, that's the third columns. You know, you get better results because you've got, you know, more, more measures there. And if you use a full model, and that could be that could include, say, years out of high school or a type of diploma, um, you get even better prediction. So, you know, what we were looking at in our study and, and what we'll be talking about today is, you know, what you make of this information. So, next slide, please. Um, so, just, you know, kind of to summarize where we are so far. Better assessment systems are needed. You know, students are not being accurately placed with, with a, you know, with a single test. Um, high school GPA is the best predictor, and there's a, you know, a bunch of studies that show this. And the last thing I might just put here is that, you know, we can improve prediction, but we're not going to get anything that's foolproof. You know, and at some point, um, you know, you want to do kind of what's a good job, what's a reasonable job. Um, with the resources you've got available. You know, you may want to use a simpler system than a more complex system, for example. And we'll talk more about that later. Next slide. Okay, so things to think about now, it sounds like um, you guys are, are thinking about this. In New York, where we've been doing some of these presentations, there are very few people that are able to, to actually administer tests. Um, they've been less successful in working it out through um, through remote pro proctoring, although a few are doing that. So some of them are turning to other measures. Um, some of them are letting students self place. And, you know, there's some research that suggests that that can be an effective method. Um, some people are, um, you know, asking students to um, bring their high school transcripts and analyzing those. So there, there are different things that are being done and I'm sure you all are thinking about your options as well. But I think the big question we have right now is, can we use this moment to think about the systems that we want going forward that work, you know, that really work well for students? Next slide, please. So what are the, what does a multiple measures system look like? Um, it involves three things. First of all, we have to think about what measures could go into it. Um, second of all, we have to think about 
what we do with the measures. So, you know, if you have a placement test, you just look at the score, but if you have more than one measure, what do you do? You know, how do you combine them to come up with a decision? And then third of all, you have to decide what you want to use it for. So traditionally it's been used for placement into college level English or math, but you know, in many cases now it's also being used for placement into co-rec, sometimes student success courses, um, you know, sometimes other, you know, um, career focused or other courses. And um, in a few cases, and this isn't as common, placement into support services where students might get more intensive support based on their placement determination. Um, so as far, just to talk through the, the actual measures that are available, there's, you know, the traditional placement tests and some colleges will come up with their own placement tests. I'll just say that there aren't too many situations where the college developed placement tests do a lot better in predicting than, than the AccuPlacer. Um, but, you know, of course, not every test has been, has been vetted. So, you know, that can depend. Um, Non-cognitive assessments, we'll talk a little bit about them. If you wanna be able to measure motivation, say, or some of the other factors that can have an influence on, on college success. Um, we found a few colleges using computer skills or career inventories, writing assessments, questionnaire items where they would ask students about their own perceptions, um, say as part of the, the admissions process or as part of the AccuPlacer test, their own perceptions about, about um, how they do in math, for example. So those are the things you can get at the college itself. Um, but, you know, we're talking a lot about about other measures and, you know, the, so the high school GPA is the one that, you know, is most commonly used other high school transcript information. Most often math courses that have been taken in high school in the grades um, and then standardized test results. So the thing about these obtained from elsewhere items is that it all takes extra steps logistically to make sure that you can have them in your hand at the moment that you need to place students. We won't have too much time to talk about that today, but you, you can read more about it in some of the um, resources that we're sharing. The next one. Okay, high school GPA. A lot of people express concerns about it, and here are four that come up most often. How are we gonna get it? Um, I kind of referenced the our test is better um, topic. The question about how long the high school GPA is predictive. What about, is it only for recent graduates or for longer? And probably the most common question we hear is whether it makes a difference to which high school you went to. So let me share some of the, um, some slides on each of those topics. Next slide, please. Okay, sources of the high school transcript. Um, many colleges have students submit a, a transcript at the time of admission. Um, many do not, but you know, in some cases, that's something that colleges may want to start doing more regularly. Um, sometimes colleges and high schools work out partnerships where the high school is regularly sending over batches of, of transcripts, often of anybody who's expressed interest in that college. Um, in a few states, they've got state data systems where the college can access um, the information you know, through the state. And finally, self-report. So self-report, you know, how accurate is it? There are actually some studies that show that students do a pretty good job of, of reporting their own, um, their own GPAs, that they're pretty accurate. So that's some of the research on the other side. And just a note there that, that in a number of places, people are using the 11th grade GPA and um, some research has shown that it's, um, it tracks quite well with the 12th grade GPA. Next slide, please. So this is a slide about different tests. So in North Carolina, they wanted to look across all the tests that they had available, and this was back in 2011 or 2012, which was quite an array and covers every bar until the last one for English and the last one for math. So those were the, the extent to which each of those predicted success in, in initial college level courses and you can say there's some variation, but none of them predict as well as the GPA, which is the last bar. So it's just, you know, again, more evidence that, that for the most part, you know, tests are, are just not gonna do as good a job. Next slide. So how long is the GPA um, 
predictive and how does it compare to, to test results? So our, our colleague John Hetz from California did some analyses. And what these charts show is if you look at that um, gray line, that gray um, line across the bottom, that's the AccuPlacer results. And what we're doing is comparing GPA to AccuPlacer. And they're really tiny numbers, but what those numbers across the bottom axis are are semesters out of high school. And it goes up to 20 on each side. So what we're seeing here is it, the, the colored lines are the 12th grade GPA and the 11th grade GPA. And what we're seeing is that in English, um, the high school GPA is doing a better job of predicting um, college level course success, even up to 20 semesters out of high school and, you know, and counting. With math, it cuts off more like at, I think it's like 16 semesters out. Um, so, you know, high school GPA can be useful for quite a long time. And, um, you know, many, many colleges will, will say, you know, we'll accept it up to say five years, you know, wanting to be conservative. You know, there are different takes on that. Um, next slide. And um, there's also been some research. This was done um, by Brad Boston in North Carolina, another colleague, looking at whether the high school, how the, whether um, the high school made a difference, whether different high schools um, were likely to predict college GPA. They were basically comparing high school GPA and college GPA. And what they found is that they track pretty well. And it's about a, um, it's about a 0 0.4, 0 0.5 difference for the most part between the college GPA and the high school GPA, college GPA being less typically, but that it made very little difference which high school you went to, which many people find unbelievable, but you know, I've heard of colleges who've done their own tests and, and found that to be true as well. So, all right, so that's enough on the high school GPA. Next slide, please. Um, so non-cognitive assessments, um, we did some work with um, colleges in Minnesota and Wisconsin that were interested in seeing whether they added to the predictive value of, of their multiple measures system. And they were especially interested in whether they might be helpful for older students or those without a high school record um, or students close to a cutoff on a test. And, um, you know, we had some evidence that, that they could you know, contribute to to making a good a good good determination. Next slide. Just a few of them that are available: um, Success Navigator or Engaged and Engaged College Board and ACT product. They both have an academic success index built into them that can um, be used as part of a placement determination. Next slide. There's also the GRIT scale. You know, which is easy to to administer because it has eight or ten items, and you know has been somewhat correlated with GPA and conscientiousness. Um, there's the Lassie from Texas, and you know that's been around for a while and is shown to be correlated with a lot of good college outcomes. So those are all things to consider. I wouldn't say that we're at the stage where we're recommending them necessarily. Next, next slide. Okay, how to combine measures. So the main ways to do that are um, through an algorithm system, you know, where you actually analyze historic data from a college and look at which factors um, with what weights actually best predict success in college level courses. And that's the approach that we tested in the State University of New York colleges. Once you've developed those weights, you end up being able to generate a, a score for each student and faculty determine where the cutoff should be on that score and students are then placed into college level or, or developmental. Um, you can also use um, a system based on decision rules or bands and I'm going to show you a picture of that in a moment. You can also um, involve students in, in making their own determination and that really should be done with advising, with informed advising and ideally with some data points in front of you. Next slide. So the algorithm example, um, so you've done the historical data analysis, your student comes in, they may have some exe exemptions. You know, for example, in New York, 
if you get a certain score on their state regions test, you don't, you know, you're just automatically into college level placement. But if you don't have those exemptions, then you, um, you know, you take the AccuPlacer, you have information from the high school record, that's all felt fed into an algorithm and you get the probability of success and, and students are placed, you know, as I just described. Next slide. If you're using a decision rule, it's more kind of a series of if then statements. So, you know, maybe the student comes in and, you know, they've gotten a good score on the ACT, they don't go any further. If they haven't, maybe you look at their high school GPA. If it's over 3.0, they go to college level. If not, maybe they go take an AccuPlacer test. Now, th these elements can be reversed or put in different order, um, but you know, so that's a determination that has to be made at the college. But there is prior research that informs some of the choices that get made when you come up with these systems. So, next slide. Decision band is almost the same, except the one difference is that you're um, basically saying that if you place between a, um, you know, between college level and just below college level, say on the AccuPlacer, we're going to look at some other information. Or say you're between a 2.6 and a 3.0, you know, so you've got, if you're within that band, we're going to look at, um, you know, we're going to have you take an AccuPlacer. So that's basically how that works. So those are your options for the most part. Um, next slide. Yeah, so um, I'm going to pass it over to um, Dan to, to share some more information from our, from our staff. Thank you, Elizabeth. Uh, okay, I think I think everyone could probably hear me, uh, so I'm just going to proceed as if I can be heard, and if not, someone will tell me. Um, so the next thing we want to do is talk a little bit about some of that research that Elizabeth mentioned uh, underlying uh, a lot of the points she was making, and particularly the research that Elizabeth and I have worked on jointly, uh, both under the CAPR Center, uh, as well as other joint MDRC, CCR, uh, CCRC projects, looking at multiple measures assessment, and 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 she mentioned in Minnesota and Wisconsin. Um, so next slide, please. Okay. So let's begin by talking about that other research. Uh, in Minnesota and Wisconsin, and we tried the more decision band approach that Elizabeth was just speaking about, decision ban, decision rule approach. And we worked with uh, four Minnesota State Colleges, com uh, community colleges, and one Wisconsin Technical College. The results I'm gonna present today are early findings that were released last year, and they only include the four Minnesota colleges, but we will be getting that fifth college into the final report um, when, when we have a little more follow-up. Next slide, please. Oh, uh, there's another bullet here. Um, so this was a randomized control trial. And so the randomization was occurring at the level of, will you have multiple measures considered as defined by each college? And we'll talk a little more about what those rules look like. Or will you just have the traditional placement test, which is an AccuPlacer test considered in your, uh, in your placement? Next slide. Placement. Yeah. Um, so there are some important terms to understand when you're interpreting the findings I'm about to show. There, uh, when we say gatekeeper course, I think most people know what this means, but it is um, it is referring to the first college level course, the first transfer level course uh, in a subject, sort of your 101 type course. And so for English, that's, you know, like that one's kind of clear. For math, it can vary a little. It's usually college algebra. So in these findings, I'm, I'm mostly talking about college algebra, although a couple of um, statistics courses that were um, for other majors were also considered uh, transfer level courses. The pass rate, when I talk about pass rate, I mean very specifically among those enrolled. Uh, this is a question that comes up a lot. Uh, faculty in particular are concerned. Uh, what is multiple measures assessment going to do to pass rates in the college level courses? And so we, we try to address that in these findings. 
And then finally, the, the kind of maybe a new term to those who haven't read these reports is something we call the bump up zone. And this is really just a subgroup that allows us to get a much more powerful analysis of the effect of multiple measures assessment among students whose placement actually would change. Um, so it turns out that the way these are set up, normally most students get the same placement they would have under the test or under the multiple measures considering high school GPA and other variables. So when you really limit it to the students who are getting a different placement, you get this perfect contrast where in that subgroup, which is defined by baseline variables uh, based on their past performance and their placement test, you have those who um, are in the program group, randomly assigned to that group are getting placed in the college level courses and those who are randomly assigned to the control group getting placed into developmental sequence courses, and they are otherwise um, equivalent on, on both observables and unobservables because of the the study design of, of randomizing them. So that's a very interesting subgroup, and it's something we return to in in all of the findings I'm sharing today. Next slide, please. So going back to what exactly were the criteria used. Um, in these multiple measure systems in Minnesota. They were using the previous version of the AccuPlacer at the time we, we did this a couple years ago. Um, and generally speaking, um, the, the cutoff range uh, that was considered eligible for being bumped into uh, college level was about one level below college level. Some of the colleges uh, adhered to this and, and then some of them actually just did more of a straight up decision rule, but the people who were most effective, affected by multiple measures were the people who would have been placed one level below. And the high school GPA cutoffs were, depending on subject or depending on college, between 2.5 to 3.0. And then they also considered, it was a kind of an either or set of decision rules. Um, so, either they had a good AccuPlacer or a good high school GPA by these standards, or in, in these pilot colleges, they looked at the LASI non-cognitive assessment motivation scale. Um, and I believe that's a, a learning and study skills inventory, uh, which has several scales, motivation being the one that a lit review um, showed correlated and predicted most highly uh, success in college level courses. And so for the most part, these colleges would look at a LASI score of four or five out of five uh, as evidence that the student had the motivation to continue with college level courses. Next slide, please. So this um, slide is really breaking down what I what I alluded to a moment ago, which is, you know, who was affected by this? So we had about, uh, you know, 3,600, uh, 3,700 students who took a placement test in English and who were randomly assigned. And that's in both groups, program and control. And about a third, a little over a third of them were placed in developmental ed, and it would have been the same if they had been in either group. They, by either criteria, they were developmental ed students. Um, then on the high end there, almost half in English would have been placed in college level by either set of criteria. It really wouldn't have changed their placement. That middle zone that's bolded is that bump up zone I mentioned. And among those students, and it's, it's only about 17%, but this randomization changed what course they were allowed to take. It was a similar proportion of students among those who tested in math, and, and that was, we had a few more students testing in math. Um, and, and, and to be clear, there was overlap in these two samples. So as you know, most students will take a placement test in both subjects, but some only had to take a placement test in one or the other. Uh, at any rate, um, in Minnesota, they had much higher cutoffs for placement into college level math than they did for college level English, and this is reflected in the proportions here. 
almost 70% of students would have been developmental under either set of placement type criteria, and only about 15% would have been college level. So again, we're really focusing on that group whose placement changed because of this intervention. Next slide. So first of all, we, we observed in the um, full sample of all randomized students, whether or not their placement changed, that just being assigned to multiple measures assessment um, made them more likely to uh, just show up that first fall. So we were looking at a fall cohort here, students testing for fall, and those who were randomized to, to that um, multiple measures were more likely to enroll. It was a small impact, and, and we really wanted to dig into that and say, well, why did that, did that even happen? Because the testing experience was no different for the two groups. We, by design, made sure that even if you were a control group student, you still were administered the last test, you still were asked for your high school grades, because we didn't want this to be a completely different testing experience. And again, we wanted to be able to do this analysis in such a way that we had all the baseline variables for both groups, and so we could focus on the bump, bump up subgroup. So given all that, we wanted to dig in. What, what was it that was that was driving this enrollment impact. And it turns out that it was really students who were bumped up into college level English by multiple measures that were driving this impact. Um, and this was really interesting because we did not see something equivalent in math. Students bump up to math didn't affect their enrollment just in, in the college in the fall. And there are a couple of kind of hypotheses for this uh, that we were able to come up with. Uh, you may have others. But one is just that there are more courses probably overall in college that require college level English as a prerequisite, um, which means it might be a little more discouraging to a student to realize they aren't going to be able to knock that out right away. Another hypothesis is that there might just be a little more stigma with being bad at English reading and writing uh, than with being bad in math culturally. You know, it, in our culture, it seems to be sort of okay to say I'm not good at math, but maybe not so not so okay to say I can't read or something like that. Uh, but these are just ideas. We don't really know, but we do we do know there's a positive impact for students who are placed um, who, who are bumped up into college level English on even just showing up at the college. Next slide please. Um, so students um, randomly assigned to multiple measures assessment, uh, assessment increase their gatekeeper enrollment in, uh, in math. Uh, sorry, this is English, in English by five percentage points. But because placement rates at baseline in English were relatively high, that's that's about a 17% increase. It's, it's not a dramatic increase. And you can see by the uh, size of the bars here um, kind of what that is proportionally. Um, but this did have effects on uh, completing uh, English. And so in the next slide, we'll look at that. So that, so that was about an eight percentage point uh, impact just on completing English that we looked at um, in the last slide, sorry. But they, they do have similar pass rates. And when I mentioned pass rates before, this is among enrolled. Uh, so, these students are about five percentage points lower uh, pass rate with a C or higher in uh, college level English than their counterparts in the control group uh, who would have just been placed into college level English by the placement test. So these are comparable pass rates. And I think keeping in mind that it's only increasing the number of students in this study uh, by 17% going into um, college level English, this would be almost undetectable in a classroom setting. You're not going to feel like, oh, my class is totally different now. No one is able to keep up. Uh, these are pretty close pass rates. And so um, the, the, the bump up zone that we talked about, when you isolate those students who placement actually changed, in the first semester, they are 28 percentage points more likely to complete that course than their control group counterparts. Now, you might say, well, of course, right? Because in the first semester, the control group wasn't placed into the course, how are they gonna pass it? And that's exactly right. These are early findings, but what we do know is 
this impact on uh, placement uh, and, 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 and completion in the first semester does set a pretty high bar for the control group catching up in subsequent semesters. Uh, and, and we also observed that students who were placed in the developmental courses didn't always even take it. And, and this is probably no surprise to, to the listeners as well. Uh, no matter what course a student is placed into does not mean they're gonna take the course. And so a student uh, being placed in a developmental course, uh, the odds of, uh, of, of even 28 percentage points passing that developmental course and enrolling in the college level course the next semester are not great. And so we just know that these students are off to a really good start. And for those of you who really want some harder evidence, we will be following up this sample for three semesters. And we already have findings from the SUNY colleges that I'm about to talk about that follow three semesters of follow up for both groups. And that gives you a more fair, I think, comparison, um, giving developmental students the chance to kind of go through their sequence. Next uh, slide. Great. So in math, we had a similar magnitude impact on um, enrollment in the, in the gatekeeper course by being assigned, but it, re it, it represents a much, much bigger proportional impact because they had set the bar, the bar so high for being placed into college level math in Minnesota, this four percentage point impact is actually an, a 75% increase and students um, taking the gatekeeper math course in their first semester. Next slide. And so um, they were, because of this, uh, again, placement doesn't equal enrollment. Um, and so there, they were 12 percentage points more likely to complete that gatekeeper uh, math course in, in, in the first semester. Because the increase was so much bigger, they, there was a bigger trade-off in pass rates. So again, keep in mind, we're almost doubling the number of students going into college level math with this intervention. And so pass rates came down and that's gonna happen really no matter what measures you're using. Um, if, if your measures have any predictive utility at all, um, you're, gonna, you're, you're gonna lower the pass rate by like doubling the number of students uh, going into the course a little bit. That said, um, these students were still, you know, much more likely to pass than they than they would have been without going into the course. And we're going to continue to monitor this over subsequent semesters. Next slide. So uh, not only will we look at the longer term follow up for this. We're going to look a little more closely at the non-cognitive assessments. Um, there is uh, a distinction to be made between, uh, you know, students placed because of high school GPA versus non-cognitive, and we haven't broken that down yet because we have a couple more cohorts that are going to be added to this uh, analysis, increasing our sample size and giving us better power on that. The um, the, uh, the analysis will also include some predictive in analysis, um, you know, looking at coefficients on the non-cognitives and some cost analysis as well. So now I'm gonna talk a little bit about uh, the longer term follow-up. And these are kind of fresh off, fresh off the press findings from the CAPR assessment study. So just a reminder, in the CAPR assessment study, we were dealing with these precision weighted algorithms that generated probabilities. And the probabilities you know, were based on the historical data coefficients from those models applied to incoming students to see how likely they were to pass college level course. The algorithms were not designed and, and, and there were lots of good reasons for this. And if you look back at uh, some of the foundational work um, that Elizabeth mentioned at the, in her presentation, there, there are limitations to, to what you can do with these models. Um, but it doesn't really tell you anything about the likelihood of, of, of passing a college level course after going through the developmental sequence. 
And so because of that, um, we were able to actually better understand some of the findings I'm about to present. Um, it, it turns out placement and developmental courses doesn't seem to prepare students very well for college level courses on average. And again, that's not, not, that's not saying it doesn't help anyone, but on average of people being placed that way. So next slide. So again, we did the, the same kind of bump up zone uh, we did for the Minnesota colleges here. And just a reminder, that means a student who, because of their ACCUPLACER would have been placed in a developmental ed, but when you look at their algorithm probability, it's above the cutoff set by the college so that they would actually have a different placement under the program, under the randomization of multiple measures than they would have in the control group. And when you limit it to that subsample, and we get to do three semesters of follow-up for this, we see that um, those bumped up into English were um, about eight to 10 percentage points uh, more likely to complete college level English after three semesters than those who were placed in developmental. Next slide, please. This pattern is similar for math. Now the baseline rates are a little lower, but the impact is about the same. And uh, even after three semesters, so a lot of these students would have had the opportunity to take their one, one level below developmental course and then go on forward. They're not passing um, their college level math at the same rates after three semesters as those in the program group. Next slide. Now this is a new take. Because of the algorithm, um, and this is something that did not happen in Minnesota and Wisconsin because of the way they designed their decision rules could only bump people up. It could never bump someone down. But a precision weighted algorithm just by, you know, by the way it works, uh, everything contributes to your probability. So that you could have a situation where someone happened to score really high on a placement test, and normally that would have placed them in a the college level, but they had such a low high school GPA that the probability is actually below the college's cutoff. And that did happen in some cases. There's a smaller group than the bump up zone, but it, it was a big enough for us to analyze in, in the SUNY colleges. And what's interesting about this is it is essentially a mirror image of the impacts we saw for the bump up zone. So despite the fact that uh, students were predicted as not likely to pass a college level course, placing them in a traditional developmental sequence did not yield a better result than they would have had just by giving them the chance anyway to take a college level course. And so the baseline rates here are lower, and that, that reflects that, yes, these students are less likely to see in college level course. The algorithm's right about that. But what it also shows is that the algorithm, assuming that they are better off in a developmental course if they're not that likely to pass college level course, is not true. And so this is a pretty major insight, and we see something similar for math in the next slide. Yeah, it's so similar, you can hardly tell the slide changed. I mean, it's it's uh, a mirror image of the bump up zone in math where program students actually perform worse by being bumped down by the algorithm. Next slide. So there's some pretty, you know, important takeaways from this. Yes, it's good to use multiple measures. Um, but I think it's important to keep in mind that just because a student doesn't have a real high uh, prediction of success in a college level course doesn't mean you're going to necessarily improve it by um, putting them in a traditional developmental sequence. That said, and I'm speaking to Texas and you guys are really moving forward with the co-requisites, that's great because I think we're starting to realize that, yeah, these students need additional supports but maybe giving it to them as a co-requisite would, would throw up fewer of those obstacles. And so, you know, what are those obstacles? I mean, there's probably a number of them, but three kind of come to mind with the traditional developmental sequence. It's the need to persist over multiple semesters. So there's like a duration obstacle. Um, and then there's also a 
uh, kind of the just the time you need to spend in class and the financial aid or tuition that you need to pay. So what you do with co requisite is you don't get rid of the latter two things. You're still going to need to ha spend more time in class and, and probably pay for the course, depending how it's set up. But you do get rid of that duration problem, that persistence over multiple semesters. And so it's quite likely that um, th that's a way of giving uh, supports that's going to be less of that negative impact we saw for students who do need the additional support. That said, I, I, I would still take these uh, findings you know, seriously because if a student really could succeed in the college level course without the co-requisite, there are still going to be some of those obstacles associated with the additional time and, and money required to kind of do the co-rec, even if it's simultaneous or, or contemporaneous with the college level course. So you wouldn't want to do it if it wasn't necessary. And um, so we'll talk now about kind of how do you make those decisions. Next slide. So just a recap from a lot of the slides we saw previously. Um, there was a visual representation from North Carolina that Elizabeth showed, and that kind of holds true more generally, that students tend to uh, get a GPA about a half point lower on a four point scale in college than they do in, um, in high school. And so the, you know, that's why you seem to know, you'll, you'll notice over and over, like set, the, the college is set uh, high school GPA cutoffs around 2.5 or between 2.5 and 3.0. And the idea there is, you know, if their high school GPA was there, like a C plus or so, um, that probably means they can get by with this, you know, in college level courses with a C or higher. Obviously, it might vary a little bit by subject. If there's very uh, specific course content that you need, you would want to look maybe a little more closely at a transcript. Um, but if if you had no other information, you could do a lot worse than just using those kind of high school GPA cutoffs and um, whether they be from the transcript or self-reported. Next slide. Directed self-placement is something that um, we really want to learn a lot more about, but there was a really great study uh, reference here um, that it was a natural experiment. You know, Suzanne mentioned uh, natural experiments at the top of the call. And, and, and so this was one of these cases where a community college just kind of forgot to renew their license for their traditional placement test. And so they were put in a position of kind of having to let students choose for themselves what course to go into. And this was not necessarily um, directed in the way we might mean with more serious advising. It was a little bit more open-ended how students were making these decisions, but there's there's really important lessons from that. The students were more likely to enroll in college and transfer level courses overall, but once you broke it down by the demographic groups, there was this um, self-selection that was really concerning. And it turns out more female, black, and Hispanic students enrolled in like arithmetic and the lowest levels of math uh, and that that really inc much more likely to do that than uh, white students, Asian students or male students. And so it was increasing that disparity of um, women and minorities going into the lowest level courses. And while there was overall a decreased withdrawal from courses, I guess students maybe felt a little more committed to their decision since they were able to make it. Um, that did end up uh, meaning that uh, when it came to completing math required for the associate's degree, it was basically, uh, you know, benefiting mainly white, Asian, and male students. So next, next slide, we can kind of talk a little bit about what, what can you do to kind of prevent that uh, exacerbation of, of gaps uh, between uh, demographic groups. And I think one thing is just to make this a lot more structured decision. Get questions um, on the admissions form ahead of time and get an advisor to look over that and have a conversation that is um, really informed by, by some training and professional development to make sure that these decisions are being made 
in a way that's not just self-confidence based because that reinforces all kinds of privilege uh, that doesn't necessarily correspond with your ability to succeed in a course. Uh, and then really monitor what, what happens when you do directed self-placement to make sure you're not seeing the same pattern we saw in that natural experiment. And I think that's it for, the, uh, for my piece of the presentation. Please do contact us if you have any questions. Thank you. Um, Kaylin, there, I saw in the Q&A that um, there was a request to go back to the Lassie slide. Um, I'm not sure if you might be able to scroll through or Elizabeth or Dan, um, would y'all maybe be able to uh, give a pointer to Keelan where that slide was? I think somebody wanted to look, look at that one a little bit longer. Um, and I do want to let everyone know that um, the PowerPoint will be available. And of course, this uh, webinar session is being recorded. Um, yeah, I'm not 100% sure what, where in the deck that was. Oh, there it is. Yep. This will be displayed. So I apologize, I didn't see who um, uh, made this request, but I hope this is what you were looking for. So we'll leave that up uh, just a little bit longer. Wow, what a, a, a wonderful resource. Thank you so much again, Elizabeth and Dan, for taking the time out to share this very valuable information. Um, many institutions, of course, are still trying to work out which kind of multiple measure factors they would like to use. Um, and so I think this information certainly is uh, timely. So uh, at this point, Keelan, I, I hope that's given enough time uh, on that slide. Uh, let's go ahead and move forward to, uh, to the end of to, to the latter part of, of the uh, presentation. There, thank you very much. Okay, so um, I think at this point, um, we can move on uh, and Dr. Melissa Humphreys and Dr. UG Kim, if you wanna go ahead and talk about uh, some of the reporting um, updates. Sure, I do wanna say that um, we will likely do another webinar uh, that will focus only on reporting <laughs> issues. So um, we just wanted to give you a little bit of an update on what's going on right now. So you have a, um, a heads up about what's coming down the line. Um, but if you are involved at all with reporting about college readiness, you know that it's, we use the CBM 002 to um, get this information from each institution on each student. And so one thing we want to reiterate about the, the different rules that are in place now, or um, just for this upcoming year, is that TSI status is still the same. So a student should only be marked as TSI met if they meet the exemptions that are in rule right now um, there's no change to what being TSI met means. What is different is we're adding an option for unknown TSI status. And this is for students who have not been able to take the TSIA um, and they haven't met through any other means. So we don't fully have enough information to know if they're TSI met or not. So that's one option that's going to be added to the 002. Another option that will be added is for students who are not met or who have an unknown TSI status, there is an option for you to say that they have a placement waiver due to COVID-19. So these are students who using either your multiple measures or whatever placement charts you're developing now, um, if they are placed using that method rather than being deemed college ready through their TSIA score, for example, then then you can mark that they're being placed with this waiver due to COVID. Um, I can't see the last bullet because the, the slides are small. Keelan, I don't know if 
we can change the view. I'm just seeing them as little icons rather than a full slide. There we go. Thank you. Um, lastly, we are developing a survey right now um, because on the CVM002, we're not able to collect the specific information about what measures uh, you all are using to place students. So we're developing a survey now to send to each institution and likely it'll be repeated at the beginning of each semester, upcoming semester, for you to tell us what measures you're using um, in order to place students. And all of this, we're, we're working hard to make these uh, changes quickly because we all know that you all are having to make these decisions quickly and we really want to be able to use what's happening now to inform um, everything going forward. So, um, you know, as you saw some of the research that was presented today, um, we would like to be able to look at the outcomes of students after this whole year of institutions using other other measures that we haven't traditionally used. So. Um, we really appreciate the quick work you all have been doing and we're trying to catch up with you on the on the data collection side. I'm happy to answer any questions, but also I think my email address will be at the end. So um, you can contact me um, through that as well. Thank you very much, Melissa. Um, and before we do get uh, more into the Q&A portion, I did want to say something else that's not directly related, but it is somewhat. We understand from um, multiple emails we've been receiving from the field, um, a lot of questions regarding the Texas College Bridge Program. Um, so uh, we understand that TEA has um, sent a, a slide deck on uh, the Texas College Bridge Program to all of their, I believe it's all their school districts and superintendents. And um, this is designed for students who um, have graduated, but have not yet met one of the, I believe it's 13 um, CCMR indicators. So CCMR, College Career and Military Indicators. That's language that K-12 uses as part of their um, assessment and accountability measures. Uh, and there is, of course, some overlap with TSI uh, exemptions, for example, SAT, ACT, and TSIA scores. Um, but again, there are uh, a number of students because of COVID restrictions that have graduated and did not meet one of those indicators. And so uh, as a way for, in, for school districts to, to get credit for those students, um, they are offering the Texas uh, College Bridge Program as, as one way. So you may be contacted by your partnering, and when I say partnering, you, the, the dual credit partners that you have, your, your school districts that partner with you for dual credit purposes, you may have been already or you may be contacted by those school districts uh, and asked to um, consider the uh, Texas College Bridge Program as a way for students to meet the college prep course TSI exemption. So um, we just wanted to let everyone know that we're aware of this. Um, and uh, it's certainly your prerogative, as it always has been, to um, consider the curriculum. I believe the two main curricula that they have been um, suggesting are from NROC and EdReady. Um, and so certainly your faculty are invited to review the curricula. Um, we also understand both of those are offered 100% uh, completely online. So some of the institutions that we have been speaking to and talking to about um, uh, their processes for considering the College Bridge Program. They were a little bit concerned because uh, of a lack of student authentication. So they would just wanted to be uh, assured that the student who is engaging in the NROC curriculum, for example, indeed is the student who would be receiving or potentially receiving uh, that TSI exemption. Um, so many institutions are currently reviewing um, the curriculum, and if they find the curriculum appropriate, they are um, possibly considering uh, whether they would like to use that uh, to qualify again 
as a TSI exemption at their institution. And that certainly would be then um, outlined in your MOU that you have with your partnering school districts for the college prep course exemption. Um, many institutions are also still concerned about the, 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 the lack of the student authentication. So um, they are uh, considering other ways. For example, if a student does complete the curriculum, then um, they are agreeing to allow the student uh, to be placed directly in a co-requisite model. Um, many institutions are also going ahead and allowing students to complete the curriculum then to build in uh, some sort of proctored uh, indicator, whether it be a final exam or uh, perhaps even the TSIA uh, as a way to confirm um, uh, the identity of the student, if you will, and then award the, the uh, exemption based on uh, those authentication um, uh, procedures. And uh, so anyway, we just wanted to, again, confirm that we're aware of this. Um, and again, we also wanted to confirm that the institution retains complete authority to determine whether they would like to include this College Bridge program as part of its MOU with your partnering school districts. And equally important, um, you, uh, the institution still retains authority to determine if the College Prep, uh, prep I'm sorry, the College Bridge program uh, indeed meets college readiness um, expectations and um, under which circumstance it may or may not meet a, uh, the, the TSI exemption as outlined and uh, through the authority given through the code in section 28014. So again, institutions, you still have uh, the authority to uh, determine whether um, completion or um, participation by students in, in those options, um, it, whether they meet your expectations and whether you would like to include that in your repertoire for the college prep course options that you have with your partnering school districts. So that said, um, I uh, did have some time to uh, scroll through some of the questions. Um, there were a few questions regarding the applicability of uh, this natural experiment, if you will, of the multiple use of multiple measures. Um, Commissioner Keller has allowed that for placements of students through summer 2021. So we do understand many um, institutions do consider fall placements in the spring time frame, and we do understand that. Um, uh, we just want to remind everyone that these exceptions did come about mostly because of limitations to accessing the TSIA. And um, we think that those limitations may not be as profound as they currently are. And, and so in spring, um, once we do uh, anticipate access to the TSIA and of course, other um, uh, ways to meet uh, TSI or to meet one of the exemptions as those become more readily available, um, uh, then uh, we believe that um, using these multiple measures uh, is not as um, uh, is not uh, you know, as needed, if, if you will, as, as it currently is with, with um, the um, profound restrictions that we have in terms of access to testing uh, and other ways to indicate and to meet one of the exemptions. So to meet college readiness, if you will. Um, so again, uh, the uh, exceptions are valid through and are applicable through student placements through summer 2021. But um, as far as the current information that we have right now, uh, any placements for fall 2021 will need to um, refer back to our traditional or what is in current rule and current statute. Um, we also had another question about rule 4.55 and that is the exceptional circumstance clause. Um, and just to um, give just a little bit of background, the original intention of this rule, of course, which was written years ago and was included in statute um, did not foresee, <laughs> which as we know, many of our rules did not foresee the environment in which we find ourselves, you know, in the, in the COVID restriction environment that we find ourselves 
And it was actually originally intended really as an exception. And a quick example I like to use is um, the international student who through no fault of their own, um, you know, were involved in some travel related delays and ended up showing up on campus either the day of or the week of uh, school starting. And so institutions um, would be able to place those students in the college level course and then sometime um, you know, when it was um, more uh, accessible for the student to get to the testing center at that point, they would be able to, to be assessed. Um, so that was the original intention. Now we, of course, are applying, allowing application for um, the, uh, for use of uh, direct placement um, purposes. And, uh, but, but again, according to uh, statute, the, the assessment is still uh, required by the end of the term. So we do also want to qualify that a little bit that this rule does, we do acknowledge that it does involve consideration of some nuances. For example, right now in a co-requisite model, if a student successfully completes the college level course, um, regardless of their performance in the developmental ed component, that student is considered TSI met, that student is considered college ready. Um, and so that also applies if a student is placed via rule 4.55 and uh, towards the end of the semester, there is clear indication that the student um, is going to pass that course. Um, and uh, according to, you know, the, the values placed on the assessment um, that the uh, faculty feels very confident that the student has um, a very good chance to pass the course then, um, you know, in that case, the student probably wouldn't be assessed um, and the student would then successfully complete the course and be considered TSI met. Um, in all other circumstances, though, we highly recommend that uh, there is a, a time made for the student to be able to be assessed. And again, however, if the student is assessed on the TSIA, doesn't meet the benchmark, but successfully completes the course again, that student is still considered TSI met. So um, those are some of the uh, questions that we have seen. And uh, Keelan, also feel free um, to uh, pull up some of the questions and you and I can go back and forth. Definitely, Suzanne. And one that uh, particularly for our uh, colleagues with the CCRC and MDRC, um, there was a question that was posed early on and it was leaning to more towards like within their experience, what traditionally do they see as the GPA set forth for uh, the high school GPA used for English uh, placements, college level English courses? Uh, so I would add a little bit to that and say, uh, if you were just considering the um, the English the English college level course, is that uh, high school GPA uh, in your experience higher or lower um, in some cases than, or is it higher or lower than that of a college level math placement? So Dan or Elizabeth, yeah. feel free to chime in. Sure, I, I think it's safe to say that um, generally speaking, math. High school GPA cutoffs are set slightly higher uh, than English. Um, and I think that, you know, that is both what has been done for various reasons of, I think there's a little more caution because so much of what makes a student capable of math is very content specific. Um, to, to, you know, to, to very specific course, uh, you know, exposure to, to different math courses. Uh, so all that said, I think the difference is not as great as you might think. And it, and it all depends a little bit on what you're trying to maximize. Like, are you trying to maximize the number of students passing a college level course? Um, or are you trying to keep that pass rate high within the course? And these will slightly change how you think about the cutoff. But I, I would say, for example, if you look at um, the work done in California uh, by John Hetz, where they set up different cutoffs for different courses and different subjects, generally speaking, the English 
high school GPAs are about a half a point or a few uh, fractions of a point lower than the math high school GPA cutoffs. Thank you. And I think the range that um, Dan showed on that slide of in um, Minnesota of 2.6 to 3.0, we see that a lot. I mean, so a lot of people are kind of landing in that zone for both English and math, I would say. Awesome, thank you. And now I'll bring it in house for uh, one question to uh, our colleagues over in strategic planning and funding. Uh, Melissa, if you could, uh, we had a reporting official um, indicate they didn't quite follow when you were talking about the placement waiver. Could you give another um, Cliff Notes version for us? Sure. And the actual um, will actually provide a lot of text about about this once we release the changes. Um, but Essentially, it's for students who either are not TSI met or have an unknown TSI status, but you are still allowing to be placed into directly into a college level course without DE support. Um, so essentially, this is kind of a waiver or what we've called a waiver in the past. So it's a, a temporary way for a student who um, either we don't know their TSI status or they have not met but you're still allowing them into that college level course. So we're adding an option for you to indicate that you're using this new waiver due to COVID um, to place the student. And you know, in the future, if this sticks around, we'll work on the language, we'll call it something else not related to COVID. Um, but right now it's it'll be clear in there that this is, this is due to the um, changes that have been brought up by, um, by COVID. Awesome, thank you. And there was one more really good question that I was um, scrolling for. Um, Keelan, while you're looking for that, um, we did have a question, um, and this is for students who were placed via the exceptional circumstance in 4. Point, rule 4.55. Um, for the students who, uh, for whom, uh, what we would call on the fence. They they have a chance of passing, but it's it's not a, a strong indication of passing the college level course. Students should be assessed prior to the end of the semester. Um, we are um, we are sticking to the the letter of the rule. And the reason why it is absolutely in the best interest of students to know what their status is before they uh, you know, complete final exams and go off until back to their, um, maybe back to their homes or back to wherever they go back to. And so if they know the outcome of that course and or of uh, the TSI results, they should already know which courses that they need to enroll in in semester. And best case scenario, they should already be registered for those courses. We know, especially that gap between fall and spring semester, and even the smaller gap between spring and summer semesters, we lose quite a bit of students. Uh, we lose we, we lose quite uh, a number of students who, um, especially if they aren't already registered in the next semester, there, there's that lack of connection and the ambiguity um, of students who don't know their status when they leave and, and they've completed their final exams is too much of a risk. So again, it is very important that those students that do need to be tested, that they be tested prior to the end of the semester. And we recommend um, you know, scheduling the, the testing perhaps two to three weeks before the final exam for those students who indicate may be borderline or may not be um, uh, passing the college course. Um, definitely to be tested and then at least they have that outcome, that TSIA outcome, and the faculty and the advisor would know what their status is and know exactly what their placement and their registration options would be for the spring semester when they return. Thank you, Susan. <laughs> and unfortunately, 
That brings us to the end of the webinar. However, we had a number of wonderful questions uh, submitted. If your question uh, was not addressed, our contact information is on the PowerPoint, as well as our colleagues who presented to you today. And you're more than welcome to email um, any of us directly with your specific question, and we'll definitely get you that uh, that requested response. So uh, a couple of follow-up things. This webinar was was recorded, it'll be placed on the Texas Higher Education Board's YouTube page probably by the end of the week, but give us till Monday to be safe. And you can search it under the name of the webinar, of uh, the printed name of the webinar. That's how it will be published. So those are the final housekeeping thoughts that I have. So at this time, uh, Suzanne, you want to close us out? All right, so I don't know what happened to uh, what happened to Suzanne. Hopefully we're still alive, but oh, I'm sorry. Yes, oh, go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, I was waiting on you. So go yes. ahead, Suzanne. You have the final I, thought. Yes, my apologies. I just wanted to thank everyone again. Um, not only are we available uh, via email, but if you prefer to set up a Teams meeting uh, with us, especially if if it's if your question is a little bit more nuanced, and you know we are able to provide some. A discussion and some feedback for your um, your questions regarding some of the um, policy decisions and and um, placement and multiple measures considerations that you're um, uh, worrying about and that you're trying to address. We are also available for that. Please email us and we'll be happy to schedule times with you and your colleagues. So that said, thank you everyone, and we look forward to seeing you again soon. <laughs>